Esther as well, because Esther certainly is not without its uh, controversy. Uh, several things to note. First of all, uh, the writer of Esther is uncertain. We don't know exactly who it is. Credit is not given uh, within the book itself. Many believe that uh, it is Mordecai, who we're going to be introduced to here in just a little bit, and, and likely so, but, but we don't know for certain. Uh, it's also one of the last written books of the Old Testament, or no way to say that, is the, the most recent or most modern. It was written sometime uh, as late as 450 B.C., as early as 331 B.C., and there's some debates out there whether it is the most recent uh, book of the Old Testament or whether that would fall to Malachi or Nehemiah, but it's certainly one of our most modern books of the Old Testament. Also, another little fact, uh, Esther is not mentioned anywhere else in your entire Bible. You'll only find her name or a reference to, to this a book, this happening that we're going to look at in just a moment, within this book itself. Also, she, it is one of two, old, uh, two books in the entire Bible uh, that is entitled by a woman's name, both Ruth and Esther. It's also one of two books, though that's debated, that does not mention the name of of God specifically. Uh, nowhere in the, in the book of Esther will you find God's name either mentioned or spelled out. And so because of that, uh, many people take issue with this book. Some uh, really don't even include it in their own uh, canon. Uh, now others would say it is the only book that does that. The, the, the second one that I reference would be Song of Solomon. But if you look at chapter 8 and verse 6, there are those that say the Almighty reference there would, would speak to God. And so they would say, no, only Esther is the only book that does not mention God specifically by name. It's also one of only two Old Testament books uh, that is set completely outside of the land of Israel. Completely, only Daniel is like that. And so because of that, its setting is within a pagan empire, the Persian empire that we're going to look at in just a moment. And because of that, that's likely the reason that God's name is not specifically mentioned. But now what I want you to understand is while you will not find God's name spelled out on the pages of Esther, I believe we see his fingerprints on every single one of them. Without a doubt, uh, certainly we see God's will and purposes for his people. Uh, some other things that are interesting about the book of Esther, you'll see where, where feasts are very prominent. There are anywhere from, from eight to ten feasts or, or great banquets, festivals, if you will, uh, that take place. Also, what you'll see much of is fasting in the book of Esther. And so because it is the Jewish people that are fasting during their time uh, of prayer to God, uh, many, and myself included, would say, well, that certainly points to God, even though his name uh, isn't spelled out there. Uh, and some other interesting facts, uh, neither John Calvin uh, nor Martin Luther, as far as it's recorded, ever preached from the book of Esther. And they certainly didn't include Esther in their commentary works. Uh, in fact, the first commentary for Esther wasn't written until it's believed well into the 7th century, which would be a thousand years after Esther, the book, was written. And, and so, but for all of those reasons, a lot of times... You don't hear messages uh, from the book of Esther. In fact, I was talking to uh, one of a staff member this week, actually one of the pastors of the church, and he said, you know, David, I, I don't know that I've heard a sermon from the book of Esther, right? And so many of you may not have because a lot of people kind of avoid that. Or I can guarantee you this, if you have heard a message from Esther, I guarantee it came from chapter 4. I guarantee it did. Uh, and most likely, the title of that message was, For Such a Time as This. Right? Because when we preach Esther, that's generally what we do. And can I tell you something? I've preached that message too. All right? I mean, it, it's, it's just there. Right? And we kind of summarize uh, everything else that's around that preceding chapter 4 and then uh, following it as well. But in my time of, of prayer and, and preparation and laying out our different preaching series, as, as I look to Esther, I, thought, you know, I really feel like that we miss something when all we focus on or put all of our focus on that that single moment in the book of Esther, that, that a single moment or decision or, or action or, or opportunity that Esther was faced with, uh, though that certainly is prominent in the book of Esther, uh, that would be the highlight of the book of Esther. But I think we miss something when we, sit, when we only focus on that. Because as we look at the book as a whole, remember there, there's 10 chapters in Esther, right? When we just focus on that, I believe we, we miss seeing that not only Esther but, but Mordecai, and the Jewish nation as a whole were all made for more. From the, from the very beginning, we, we see that continuation of the covenant that God gave to Abraham 
for His promised people. And I believe that carries even into us today. Listen, as believers, listen, we as true believers today, we are made for more. And I think too often we don't take hold of that fact that we're made for more, that God has a bigger plan and purpose for our life. And our purpose, our life, our meaning doesn't boil down to that, that single moment. It's not like as a Christian you peak at some point, right? Now, what does come down to a single moment is salvation, right? Now, I understand that, that, that time and, and place in our life when we uh, understand that we're a sinner, we understand the gospel message that, that Christ alone died for our sins, and when we uh, repent of our sins, trust Him as Savior, and we uh, believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that He is Lord, listen, at that moment, we are saved. But as a believer, listen, it's not like if, if you fail, because uh, as a believer, there, life ebbs and flows. Right? There, there are times when, uh, when we're on those mountaintop experiences where we're walking with God and serving God, and there's those valleys that we fail God. Right? And, and it's not like, okay, I missed my opportunity, and it's never going to come again. No, you are made for more, regardless of your age, regardless of your past, regardless of your circumstances. And so with that said, I want us to jump in this morning as we look at the book of Esther. We're going to... Begin in chapter 1 and verse 1, and I'm going to try to carry us all the way through chapter 2 and verse 18 today. So I'm giving you the time now to find that in your Bible if you open the church app. All the text is there, but I'm going to do a significant amount of reading of the text today, and, and purposely so, because I think it's important for us to look at that. Uh, and also, uh, here at Northside, that is one of the things that's unique about us and what we believe about the Word of God. See, it's not important, uh, I don't lay this down right here and occasionally reference the Word of God and then tell you a bunch of stories. No, we look to God's Word because we believe it's God's Word, not my Word, His Word that's infallible. Amen? Uh, it's His Word that is in error, and it is without error. It has always been true, and it always will be true. All right, so we preach the Word of God. In our Connect Group classes, we teach the Word of God. In our time of worship through song, we sing the Word of God. And so with that said, I've given you plenty of time to find it. Now, Esther chapter 1, let's jump in, verse 1. These events took place during the days of Ahasuerus, who ruled 127 provinces from India to Cush. In those days, King Ahasuerus uh, reigned from his royal throne in the fortress of Susa. He held a feast in the third year of his reign for all his officials and staff, the army of Persia and Media, the nobles and the officials from the provinces. He displayed the glorious wealth of his kingdom and the magnificent splendor of his greatness for a total of 180 days. At the end of this time, the king held a week-long banquet in the garden courtyard of the royal palace for all the people, from the greatest to the least, who were present in the fortress of Susa. Drinks were served in an array of golden goblets, each with a different design. Royal wine flowed freely according to the king's bounty. The drinking was according to the royal decree. And here it is. Are you ready? There are no restrictions. The king had ordered every wine steward in his household to serve whatever each person wanted. Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women of King Harris's palace. And I, I'm going to pause there for a moment as we look at this introduction. First of all, we're, we're introduced here to the, the king of Persia, Persia. Uh, Ahasuerus, right? Uh, not an easy word to say. His Greek name is actually Xerxes. Some translations actually include that. Unfortunately for me, the CSB does not, so we're going to go with what they've got here, right? Uh, but what you need to understand about this king, he was the most powerful man on the planet, right? And he had the ego that matched it too, right? I mean, he, I mean look, look, look right here. He, he put all this on display this, 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 uh, what for his greatness. For 108 days, he wanted the, the world to see how great he was, how powerful he was. And truly, he was. I mean, Persia was, uh, was a massive. Matter of fact, I've got a map for my, uh, for my map geeks this morning uh, that I think we can pull up. There we go. Um, if you're looking in the church app, there's actually two maps there that you can look at. Um, one is from the Persian uh, Empire and Kingdom. The other is what you see here that's overlaid uh, a modern map. But you can see the size of this thing, right? I mean, from the Mediterranean Sea to, to the Indian Ocean, I mean, all the way, it, it's not listed there. Uh, there was no bridge at that point either between the two, but uh, a little political joke there. I, you'll catch it later. Um, uh, but anyway, look at the size of this thing. 
Bulgaria to, to Egypt to, to Pakistan. I mean, that was a massive empire in this day. A, at a time when it was very difficult to, uh, to travel or, or to communicate, it was, it was very hard to have that much land and have control of it. And yet, King Ahasuerus did. Right? Look at the size of this thing. It, it said that uh, at its peak or at its height, it was more than 3 million square miles. Right? Uh, that would be uh, compared to the size of the United States and all of its territory, Alaska, why everything included today. Again, a, a, a massive empire. And, and it would remain that way for uh, more than 200 years until eventually it was conquered by Alexander the Great. And, and we're also introduced here, it says this story takes place not only in the region, but in the capital of Susa. Now, Susa would have been located where you see Iran today. All right, So, so that would have been the location uh, of this great banquet and where the kings of palace and headquarters were. So with that being said then, uh, here he is. He's at his palace. He, he wants to show the world, uh, show all of his kingdom how great he is, uh, how powerful he is, how wealthy he is. And so he has a 180-day open house. Right, just, just open, wants to show everybody how, how amazing he is, how, how wealthy he is for 180 days. All the, uh, the dignitaries, the, the military leaders, everyone was, was invited in, anyone that was important at all in the kingdom. Six months of just absolute, endless debauchery. I mean, the, 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 the party had one rule, and that rule was a decree that there are no rules. Did you see that? There, there are no restrictions on this one. I mean, people, you, you, they took open bar to an extreme on this one, right? I mean, it, it just never stopped flowing. All they wanted, right? And after six months of this, of all you can eat, all you can drink, all the, the debauchery you want, then they concluded it with a week-long party that everyone in the whole region, regardless if they were important or not, they were invited to come and join in. Let's keep reading verse 10. On the seventh day, when the king was feeling good from the wine... Ahasuerus commanded his seven eunuchs who personally served him to bring Queen Vashti before him with her royal crown. He wanted to show off her beauty to the people and the officials because she was very beautiful. But Queen Vashti refused to come to the king at his command that was delivered by his eunuchs. The king became furious and his anger burned within him. The king then consulted the, the wise men who understood the times. Verse 15 the king asked, according to the law, what should be done with Queen Vashti since she refused to obey King Ahasuerus' command that was delivered by the eunuchs? Mimikin said in the presence of the king and all his officials, Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but all the officials and the peoples who are in every one of King Ahasuerus. <laughs> See, I told you I was going to. Xerxes' provinces. For the queen's action will become public knowledge to all the women. And cause them to despise their husbands. Verse 19. If it meets the king's approval, he should personally issue a royal decree. Let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it cannot be revoked. Vashti is not to enter King Ahar Xerxes's there we go, presence. For her royal position is to be given to another woman who is more worthy than she. The decree the king issues will be heard throughout his vast kingdom. So all the women then will honor their husbands from the greatest to the least. All right, let's, let's pause again. The king here, so now then, I mean, it's, uh, the, the party's kind of coming to a close and everybody's feeling no pain, certainly the king at this point, right? And he wants to show off now his wife, his queen. And so he sends word to the news. He says, listen, tell her to put on her crown and come prance around for everybody. They've seen everything else I've owned. Now I want them to see my queen as well. Now, some people believe that this request meant that she was to show up to the party wearing only her crown to show all of her beauty. We don't know that for sure, but, but many believe that. But what happens in is this turn of events, Queen Vashti says, I ain't coming. You tell the king, I said no. Now, word comes back, and the king, and I, again, he, he's not of the greatest mindset at this moment, right, with all the wine and everything else. And in front of all of his boys, this eunuch says, she told you no. They don't know what to do. He's uh, certainly embarrassed, and, and he consults with, uh, with his boys, right? And Molary and Curly, he, he gathers them up, and they say, all right, boys, what are we going to do? Right, the, the queen has said no to me. 
And so they start deliberating there and trying to figure out, hey, what, what are we going to do? And, and obviously they're more concerned, not so much with the queen and Vashti and their relationship. But hey, man, we're, we're afraid our wives are going to get word of this, right? And then they're not going to listen. I mean, if, if the queen doesn't listen to the king, we don't stand a chance when we go home. We got to fix this, right? So they come up with a plan. Now, what's really interesting here, Vashti, she didn't want to see the king, Right? And she was being punished for saying, I don't want to see him. And the punishment they rendered to her was, oh, yeah? Well, guess what? You can't ever see him again. That's what they came up with, right? And you know word got back. And she said, well, good. That's what I wanted in the first place, right? I mean, it's like telling your kids, hey, you're grounded. Go to your room and take your phone with you. Okay, right? I mean, that's nothing, right? Go up and play video games. Think about what you've done. I can't believe you said that. Here's some ice cream. (laughs) That's real. She got what she wanted. Let's keep reading. Chapter 2. Sometime later then, when King Ahasuerus' rage had cooled down, he remembered Vashti, what she had done and what was decided against her. The king's personal attendant suggested, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in each province of his kingdom so that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem at the fortress of Susa. Put them under the supervision of Haggai, the king's eunuch, keeper of the women, and give them the required beauty treatments. Then the young woman who pleases the king will become queen instead of Vashti. This suggestion obviously pleased the king, and he did accordingly. In the fortress of Susa, there was a Jewish man named Mordecai, son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite. Kish had, take, had, excuse me, Kish had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the other captives when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took King Jeconiah of Judah into exile. Mordecai was the legal guardian of his cousin Hadassah, that is, Esther, because she had no father or mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was extremely good-looking. When her father and mother died, Mordecai had adopted her as his own daughter. And when the king's command and edict came, became public knowledge, and when many young women were gathered at the fortress of Susa under Haggai's supervision, Esther was taken to the palace into the supervision of Haggai, keeper of the women. The young woman pleased him and gained his favor so that he accelerated the process of the beauty treatments and the special diet that she received. He assigned seven hand-picked female servants to her from the palace and transferred her and her servants to the harem's very best quarters. Esther did not reveal her ethnicity or her family background because Mordecai had ordered her not to make them known. Every day, Mordecai took a walk in front of the harem's courtyard to learn how Esther was doing and to see what was happening to her. During the year before each young woman's turn to go to King Ahasuerus, The harem regulation required her to receive beauty treatments with oil of myrrh for six months and then with perfumes and cosmetics for another six months. When the young woman would go to the king, she was given whatever she requested to take with her from the harem to the palace. She would go in the evening and in the morning she would return to a second harem under the supervision of the king's unit, say Ashgaz, keeper of the concubines. She never went to the king again unless he desired her and summoned her by name. Esther was the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had adopted her as his own daughter. And when her time came to go to the king, she did not ask for anything except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, keeper of the women, suggested. Esther gained favor in the eyes of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Ahasuerus in the palace in the tenth month of the month Tebeth in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she won more favor and approval from him than did any of the young other virgins. He placed the royal crown on her head and made her his queen in the place of Vashti. Well, let's look at what's taking place now, right? So, so after all this has gone down, after uh, everything has taken place, and, and Vashti's had that horrible punishment of getting what she wanted in the first place, all right, it says, then sometime later. Now, we don't know when that is. We know by the dates given. It, it could have been as long as three years later. 
Uh, it could have been days later. But certainly enough time, the liquor's worn off, right? He's coming to his senses. The, the party's over. Everybody's gone home. Uh, all is good, at least for the men. I don't know about the women in this place, but, uh, right? but, but, but everything was good. And the king starts reminiscing. He starts missing his wife, his, his queen. He starts thinking about what had taken place, and now that he's coming to his senses, yeah, certainly he's at that place where he's thinking, you know, maybe I re overreacted. Maybe I, I didn't treat this situation right. I mean, he, he starts missing her. He started remembering not only what she had done wrong, but, but all the good things in their life. And isn't that so true in life? Sometimes you, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Can, can anybody relate to that? Hey, not only in relationships, but, but with all kinds of things. Until you've gone without it, you don't know what you have. You want me to tell you somebody who appreciates food? Someone who's gone hungry. You go days without food, you don't care how that steak's cooked. You don't care if it's a casserole that they lay in. You're just thankful for food. Amen? Uh, hey, with jobs. You know, when you've got a job and that paycheck's coming in, you know what we often do? Well, I don't like the hours. Well, I don't like my boss. Well, I don't like this. Well, I wish I could do that. Well, I wish I had their office. Well, you know, we, all we see is the bad. You know who appreciates their job? Somebody who's been unemployed. You go a week, you, you go a few months, and you're like, man, how am I going to pay the bills? Now, all of a sudden, any job looks good. You're just thankful for the opportunity to work. You're thankful for the opportunity to provide for yourself, for, for your family. Sometimes we don't realize what we have until it's gone. I see that with young married couples all the time. You know, man, when, 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 we're, when they're engaged, and oh, it's, everything's perfect. He looks perfect. She looks perfect. Everything. Man, she, they, there are no faults whatsoever. And then you get married, Right? And all of a sudden, those faults start uh, coming to the surface, don't they? And if we're not careful, then what, what we do in our relationship, and our marriages, we just focus on those faults. And we forget about all of the positive, all the good things, all the things we fell in love with. Matter of fact, that's one of the things I, I said. I see a couple back there in the corner now that have recently done this. When they sit on the couch, I say, right, tell me first, what do you most love about them? And don't ever forget that because that trumps everything else. All these other little innuendos, the things that drive you crazy, don't lose sight of what you fell in love for. That's what he had done. He had walked away. I can't tell you how many times I visit in a nursing home. And I visit with someone who can no longer go to church. And they say, Pastor, what I miss more than anything in this world is worshiping with my church family. Oh, just, you, you'll see the tears flow and you, you, you'll, you'll hear it and you'll see it. Just the, the hurt that they have, that they, they can't come and, uh, like we are today and, and gather with their church family and worship together. And some of them will say, you know, I listen or I watch online or all that, but it's just not the same as being together. And then I, I meet other people that they have every ability to be here as often as they want. But you know, well, we come at Easter, Christmas. Hey, if the weather's good and there's nothing else on the calendar, we, we try to come a couple times through the year. It, and they just don't understand what they have. Man, look what COVID did to us. Man, when, when all of a sudden said, hey, we're not going to be able to meet for a little while, I mean, Christians were outraged. You're going to tell me I can't worship. And then the doors opened back up. And 75% of those upset people returned. Right? We don't know what we have until we don't have it. And then sometimes when we get back, we... We still don't appreciate it. I can go on and on there, can I? But that's where he is. He, he, he begins to realize, you know, she really was a good boy. I really did love her. Oh, she was beautiful. Hey, we had these good moments together. And so his boys come up with another idea. And this one, probably a little better for the king, they're going to have this beauty pageant, right? And so listen, we're, we're going to take the, uh, the most beautiful young virgins in all 127 provinces. And we're going to bring them into the palace. We're going to give them a, a year. Ladies, I mean, look, look at that. My goodness, just a year of beauty treatments. Rain Tree Salon and Starbucks for a whole year, right? You're not even, King, you're not even going to see them until we're done with all that stuff, right? We're, we're, we're going, this was before Photoshop when you could fix up a picture and this is what she could look like, right? They actually did it, right? Uh, got them all Photoshopped up in, in, in real time and then would present them. And then we're introduced then to, to Mordecai and Esther. Now, there are these two Jewish people who were uh, living still in Persia. They, they were living they were exiles uh, that were living in the pagan land of Persia. Now, it gives us all these details about them because it's important to understand that a hundred years prior to this happening, God had allowed Nebuchadnezzar to conquer Judah. And when he did, he took the Jews captive. Now, God could have allowed him to wipe them out, but because of his promise and love for his people, instead, they were just in captivity. And God did that because they had turned their backs on him. 
That's what we see in the book of Daniel with all the exiles there and the, the Hebrew children. Well, then Cyrus, who was the first king of Persia, he defeats Babylon. And when he does, he actually allows the Jews to return to Jerusalem. And many, if not most, did, but, but some remained where they were as exiles. And that was a story for Mordecai and, and his family. And so now Mordecai had taken in his cousin, which is really more like his niece, as his young daughter. Because her parents, obviously, at an early age in her life, had died during this time of captivity. So, so here Esther is. She's this Jewish orphan girl. And once again, we see on these pages what, what we carried uh, through the book of Genesis where God continues to remember his promise to his chosen people. That promise given to, to Abraham who shared with Isaac, who shared with Jacob, who shared to Joseph and, and, and his 11 brothers that they would be a Jewish nation, that they would prosper. And Esther's story, man, when, when you look at this, doesn't it remind you of Joseph? I mean, look at all the similarities there, all the provisions that were given to someone that didn't deserve it, all, all of the favor uh, that, that, that she carried just like Joseph did. In fact, it even says that, that Esther was from the tribe of Benjamin. You may recall from our study, Joseph's youngest brother. But there's another thing we see here too. This is something that people, especially outside of the church, like to point out. Well, look at that trash in the Bible. Man, how, look, what the, look how they treated women in the Bible, right? You, you ever had that? And that's true. Again, what we're getting to see here is a society prior to or in the absence of Christianity. And here it is. Look how women were regarded. I mean, as objects at best. And ladies, what you need to understand, listen, nothing in all of history has been more liberating, more empowering than the advent of Christianity. Go somewhere where it's absent and you'll see it even today. But not only that, we, we also see a picture of, of life without the conviction of God. I mean, here it is, harems, concubines, drunkenness, uh, enics. We, we, we can go on and on. Now, that's not God's will. That's man's divergence from God's design in Genesis. Amen. Man left alone, here's what you get. And yet, even in the midst of this, even in the midst of this wicked debauchery, God still provides. And God still protects his people. And so they have this, um, this pageant, right? And after the, the year-long process, and they're as pretty as they're going to get, right? Uh, they have hit their prime. And they get to go to this wardrobe room. And ladies, best we can tell, it's, it's I don't know, maybe the size of this auditorium. And nothing but dresses and jewelry. And I mean, you, shoes, man, I mean, you name it. And they get to pick whatever they want. Diamonds, pearls, you, you pick it out. And you can wear it in front of the king, right? And, and, and that's exactly what they do. They, they, they get to choose the, the best of everything. And then when they go in front of the king, one of three things is going to happen. He's either going to give them a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or, yeah, you make it to round two, right? Harem number two, and I may call you later, right? That's the way it went down. And all these women, after all this process, and these other women, right, who were obviously beautiful, they were the most beautiful of all the provinces, Likely chose the, the most expensive, the most uh, uh, gaudy, uh, you know, I mean, just these huge diamonds and, and all these things. And I'm sure probably acted the part too, right? A lot of karen things going on right there, right? Uh, without a doubt. But we have this comparison of Esther in her humility and, and the favor that's on her from God that says won everyone over. From day one, man, she got the, the best place to stay. From, from day one, she got uh, the, the, the best attendance to her needs. From, from day one, she got all the favor because of God's desire for her life. Doesn't that remind you of Joseph? Man, whether he was in a pit, whether he was in a palace, whether he was in a prison, he still carried God's favor. We see that with, with Esther. And there's something else I want you to see, ladies in particular. Esther here actually asked for a man's input on what she should wear. Did you catch that? <laughs> asked Haggai, hey, you tell me what I should wear. And listen to him. It's biblical. And it worked, right? Asked him what he thought, did it, and was successful. I know that was a long time ago, right? Uh, and I don't go there personally. I've told y'all before, when my wife does that to me, I have learned. Early on, I gave my opinion. After years of marriage, you realize it doesn't matter, right? Uh, you want to win the war, not the battle. And so my response is, well, which one do you like more? 
Well, I like this one. What do you think? I like that one too, right? I mean, that's, well, this woman goes into just a, a big wardrobe room and says, hey, buddy, you pick it out. And, uh, way too much time there. All right. So she does it, and she gets the rose, places the crown on her head. The outcast is chosen as queen. Guys, here's where I want us to, how much time do I got, Terry? Where are we at? We, oh, okay. Um, here's where I want us to land today. The world. The world saw Vashti as favored over all women. I mean, she was it. She, she, she was the queen of the greatest empire. They saw her as favored. And the world looked at Esther as this poor, orphaned minority. See, she had chosen as a Jew not to return to Jerusalem, right? So amongst the Jewish people, she was kind of outcast, right? Because she thought, why, why wouldn't you return to come back to, to reestablish the temple and to worship? And in her place, she was a one of only a few Jews who were looked down upon. So here she is, this poor, orphan minority. And yet God had other plans in the works. Now, let's look at this also. Esther was not a woman above reproach. I mean, you could really even say she wasn't at all walking with God at this time. I mean, if she had, likely she would have returned to Jerusalem with the others when they had the opportunity to do it, and, and she chose to stay, right? She participated in this beauty pageant, going to harems and knowing what the outcome, even if she wasn't chosen as queen, she was probably still going to be stuck there for his favors and other things, and she still did it. So she wasn't walking with God, but that didn't stop God from walking with her, did it? See, she was a Jew. She was a, a promised child of God. And even then, he was still with her. And the outcome of that, hey, the inferior would become the favor. The, the chastised would become the cherished. We, we can go on and on, right? And we look at this and we say, why is it in Scripture? Why does God do that? Or, or why does God allow that? And yet we're reminded, Isaiah 55, his ways are not our ways. God does things in his ways for our benefit. And though it may not make sense to us in the time, but we're able to look back on that. Uh, e even Jesus told Paul, do you remember in 2 Corinthians 11, 9, and 10? He said, listen, I want you to understand, it is in your weakness that God's strength shines the most. He'll take our failures. He'll take our weakness, and he'll use them for his glory. Friends, regardless of where you are today, regardless of uh, what's happening in your life, regardless of how the world sees you, you're created in the image of God. You have the Imago day that we looked at in Genesis. And listen, if you're a believer, you are made for more. And so if you're a believer, believe it. Live it that you're made for more. And if you've never given your life to Christ, friend, receive it. So you can realize that you are made for more. Romans 8, 28 and 31, we know it well. As we know all, all things work together for the good of those who are, love God and who are called according to His purpose. Verse 31, what then are we to say about these things? If God is with us or for us, who can stand against us? Friends, I'm made for more. You're made for more. Northside is made for more. The only question is, when will we start living like it? Not just get it going through the motions, doing the minimum, but when are we going to be all in? I believe it. I believe you're made for more and greater things. I believe your best has not yet come. I believe that for our church. But when will we more than just give it lip service and start living that out? Ephesians 2.10, we're His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for a purpose, and that is to do good works, which God has created in advance for us to do. Friends, we got, we got to take hold of it. If you're a believer, I don't care where you are right now. I don't care what happened to you last night. I don't care about your past. You are made for more. And hey, can I tell you this? That's why we need you here too. Listen, we invest in our children at all ages, from the youngest to the oldest, our students upstairs, our college ministry, and we need you. We need you as adults to, to come alongside of us and, and, and pour ourselves into them. Why? Because we believe they're made for more. And we want to do all we can as a church to, to equip you as adults and to equip our, our children in all ages 
to live it out and be purposeful. Life's full of difficulties, full of disappointments, hurts, heartaches, you name it. The only question is, how will you handle it? Will you believe you're made for more? Will you trust that your test will be a testimony? Do you actually believe that God can make your mess into a message? Friends, you're made for more. And as a church body, a church isn't isn't walls, it's not bricks and sticks, it's the people. Listen, we are called for a purpose for so much more. 